The member for Durham. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's always a pleasure to rise in this House representing my home communities in Durham. And the last time I rose in this House on January 31st, my speech was on Ukraine, Mr. Speaker. And of course, a lot has changed since that speech, Mr. Speaker. Of course, for me and where I sit in this chamber, but more importantly, and something that has had the world transfixed, our fears about a Russian invasion were actualized. We've seen horrific videos of indiscriminate violence towards civilian populations by Mr. Putin and his Russian aggression. We've seen inspiring stories of parliamentarians, of elderly people, of people who've never held a rifle, picking one up to defend their land, to defend their community, to defend their country. So our fears have been actualized, Mr. Speaker, and when I last rose in this House, I never thought we would see the extent of aggression we see. So being back, and it's good to be back, Mr. Speaker, I want to start off by thanking all members of this House for their remarks tonight. This has been nice to see all sides coming together to stand up for our friends in Ukraine. I want to thank the government for moving on weapons for our allies in Ukraine. That was the subject of our debate a month ago, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank them for the aid that's been provided, the move alongside our allies to take Russia out of the swift financial system, the restrictions on airspace. There must be a full court press of both diplomatic and security pressures brought to bear to halt this aggression and save lives. Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the government, I want to thank the Conservative opposition and all members of this House for this debate tonight. I'd also like to thank Canadians business leaders, community and charity leaders across the country stepping up, donating, doing drives to raise awareness and raise funds to help. And particularly, I want to thank the Ukrainian-Canadian community, Mr. Speaker, who have always inspired me from my very first speech as a fledgling politician in the Dnipro Hall in Oshawa with members of the long-standing Ukrainian community there, the, Ukrainian, the League of Ukrainian-Canadians, the Ukrainian-Canadian Congress, charities, credit unions across this country are stepping up, and I know that is providing hope. So the debate we have here tonight, Mr. Speaker, is one of unity because it's about the values we represent as a country, the commitment to liberty, to democracy, to the rule of law that we want to see our millions of friends in Ukraine have as well, Mr. Speaker. And it's been shocking to hear some of the stories. This morning, I heard an interview with a Ukrainian Member of Parliament. She's 37, Ina Suvsan. And here's what she said, speaking to a Canadian journalist, Mr. Speaker. I'm so much better with words than with arms, but I will pick up arms if it comes to that." End quote. We're so fortunate in this House, Mr. Speaker, that we never have to worry about going beyond our words. The very fact that we see the President, we see members of all sides of their Parliament stepping up, inspiring and even taking up arms to defend their land. It's something as Canadians we have to act and we have to be relevant within NATO, within the United Nations, within the G7, the G20, to make sure countries like Ukraine don't face this brazen aggression this hostility of the highest order, or else we will become a world where politicians have to stop the words and pick up the arms, Mr. Speaker. And that's a scary notion. So I want Ms. Suvsan to know parliamentarians around the world, including here in Canada, are going to fight hard to make sure she can continue to fight with her words and her democracy and not have to resort to picking up arms. So in the spirit of cooperation with my words of thanks, uh, I would like to provide two recommendations to the government in this debate. It is an honour for me, Mr. Speaker, to be here as the Member of Parliament for my hometown. I am also a proud veteran, Mr. Speaker. We need foreign affairs policy 
targeted policy, which is based on our country's values, our societal values, and also based on our allies, our friends around the world, including Ukraine. Specific recommendations that I'd like to bring to the government's attention. First is we have to have a return to interest-based foreign policy. What are our interests from an economic and trade standpoint? What are our diplomatic, our humanitarian assistance interests as a nation? What are our security concerns, our defense alliances as a country? We are one of the most multilateral countries in the world because we've always had to be as a trading nation, as a nation that straddles the northern half of the Americas, Mr. Speaker, a nation born not of revolution, but evolution from an empire, and now stand as one of the world's great democracies. We have to have our foreign policy not based on appealing to small groups, appealing to the, the issue of the day. We have to make it based on our strategic long-term interests as a country and on our values as a country, Mr. Speaker. The Deputy Prime Minister, when she laid out this government's foreign policy approach in a speech in this place in 2017, she began her remarks with a question. Is Canada an essential country at this time in the life of our planet? End quote, Mr. Speaker. It then did not really lay out interests, but laid out a number of emerging issues. And we've seen that repeatedly with progressive trade agendas, with climate change and other issues f outflanking our economic, our security, our trade, our diplomatic, our humanitarian interests as a country. And that has to change, Mr. Speaker, because all issues are a priority, from climate change to some of the progressive trade agenda that was promoted with the United States. But our security as a country, our relevance within NATO, within NORAD, are critical to what our country must advance. And so I would ask the government, in the spirit of cooperation we see here, to make sure that we have the equipment we need for our Canadian Armed Forces, that we arm our diplomats, our aid workers, with the tools and the funds they need to assert our interest and will around the world, Mr. Speaker. We've been lulled out of a sense of complacency. The second recommendation I would have, Mr. Speaker, relates to our Arctic, something that I've been talking about for many years, something that I was pleased to work with Michael Levitt when he was chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, and we conducted the most robust examination of our interests in the Arctic in a generation. Nation building at home, vigilance beyond, preparing for the coming decades in the Arctic. An April 2019 report it stated that the Arctic is fundamental and an indivisible part of Canada, and that right now, when we wrote it in 2019, our sovereignty is at risk. The first section of that report, Mr. Speaker, dealt with Russian military and security buildup in their portion of the Arctic. Russian interest in the continental shelf, Russian interest in polar trade and, and circumnavigation routes, Mr. Speaker. We are decades behind where we need to be in asserting our Arctic sovereignty. We the North, Mr. Speaker, should be more than a hashtag that we use when we're proud of our basketball team. This defining element of our country right now is in jeopardy. So we need the ships, the drones, the personnel, the rangers, the infrastructure investments to realize the true potential of Canada and recognize that we are a neighboring country to Russia, Mr. Speaker. We also have to, based on our national interest and a foreign policy based on that, help our friends in Ukraine. So the continued support through the winding down of the SWIFT financial system in sanctions, including the Magnitsky sanctions, help brought in by my friend from Selkirk Interlake Eastman, we need to make sure that we have the military equipment needed for Ukraine to defend itself. And we should work within NATO to see how we can put parameters, including looking at restricting the ability for Russia to inflict more damage 
and then of course help with refugee support, Mr. Speaker. The 1.4 million Ukrainian Canadians have helped build this country. Canada was the first nation to recognize Ukraine, and tonight, let's show as parliamentarians that we will continue to be one of the strongest, one of the most consistent, and one of the most steadfast allies of Ukraine. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay.